everyone. Thanks for coming by our station. Uh, by the way, Kronos Ministries, or Kronos Messenger, is based on what Paul said to the Thessalonians concerning brethren, the times and seasons, Kronos and Kairos in the Greek. Um, you well know that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So uh, we took for our name to just distinguish us uh, from others. Uh, the concept of the Kronos is that there's a chronological order to the plan of redemption in terms of thousand year days. There's a great week of thousand year days and the early church for the first 300 years freely and thought it to be sound doctrine that Jesus would come again after the 6,000 years from Adam to start the seventh thousand year day. And uh, so we decided many people know about the signs of his coming, but maybe not so much about the great week, which is our core message, so that we can tell Jesus is coming soon based on not just signs, but by also looking at the chronos times. That is, where are we in terms of the completion of 6,000 years from Adam? We found it's really uh, easier to ask the question, uh, in fact, God made it easy for us, Jesus, by telling us that he would uh, have a messianic ministry that would include us and that this messianic ministry would last 2,000 years of prophetic today and tomorrow. Again, based on this Kronos times concept, then he would come the third day if you look at it from that perspective. So that's what we're about here on this uh, video channel. And we have been looking at Revelation chapter 7. I've been drawn to this. And so I'm just going to read first the passage and then get into uh, something I feel is very important or something that I don't think anybody has seen before. At least I haven't heard about it. Maybe they have, but in any event, Let's look at Revelation 7 because what has happened in Revelation 6 is that we've had the six seals and the sixth seal shows us the darkening of the sun, moon, and stars and all of the world proclaiming um, some in anticipation and some uh, with a great urgency of panic that the great day of his wrath has come. Why is that important? Because Jesus taught that immediately after the tribulation of those days, which we found and learned to be a long event that has spanned the entire church age, that immediately after that tribulation, the sun, moon, and stars will be darkened. That celestial sign of darkness would announce the coming of the day of the Lord. Why is that important? Because that's when Jesus comes. You see, this seventh day is called officially in Scripture the day of the Lord. What we have then is in the sixth seal, we have the coming of the day of the Lord, and this is when He comes, just as Jesus taught in His Olivet teaching, that the tribulation of those days come to an immediate end, Announced by the darkening of the sun, moon, and stars, the celestial sign of darkness happening simultaneously all over the world, that would announce the coming of that day, um, the snare of that day in Luke 21, and then they would see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Um, that's when in Luke it says, so when you see these things begin to happen, signs in the sun, moon, and stars after the regathering of Israel, <laughs> being scattered among the nations all these years, um, that you will lift up your heads and look up knowing that your redemption, your redemption, that's not talking about whether you're born again or not. That's talking about the salvation of your body, which is when we get a glorified body just like his. So that's what's happened in the sixth seal in the book of Revelation. Um, we see everything that Jesus said we would see. So what we would expect to see in Revelation chapter 7 then 
is the rapture, the gathering of his church, his body, his bride. You know, we are um, all those things in a spiritual sense. So we also want to point out that this also tells us that the end of this present age has just happened at the sixth seal. We know that because, see, God gave us this great week so that we could understand the concept of ages. And this was well known even in Old Testament times by rabbis and so forth. And uh, the patriarchs uh, that came forth uh, in the Adamic line after uh, in the Seth and so forth, they knew that time would be divided up in terms of ages and that each age would last 2,000 years. So 2,000 years without the law and then another 2,000 years under the law of Moses and that's 4,000 years and that brings us up to the time when Jesus entered his ministry at age 30. You see, the 4,000 years came to an end there with his ministry, not his birth in Bethlehem. That's an important point. But the 4,000 years bring us all the way forward to the start of his ministry when John baptized him and Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. That's why he could then say, you've got another 2,000 years or the church age, a prophetic today and tomorrow from his point of ministry, the Messianic age. That brings the total of 1,000 years to 6,000 years and uh, the end of this present age is the end of this sixth uh, day. So that means that then this seventh and last day Remember the last day Jesus said he would raise us up. It's a resurrection term. And that's scheduled for the start of this last day. Or seventh day from Adam. Or if you prefer, the day of the Lord. So that's kind of the concept here. And that means that this seventh day begins the age to come. What most people don't realize is that when you come to the end of this age, that's when Jesus comes. I mean, the disciples got the question right. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of this age? And he told them, the signs and the sun, moon, and stars, and so forth. Everything, basically, I've just explained. So we have been mistaught that this age ends with the battle of Armageddon, which we see in Revelation 19. That's when the Antichrist is thrown together with the false prophet into the lake of fire. That is not so. So this age does not end with the great supper of God or the battle of Armageddon, if you prefer. Rather, it ends with the Lord Jesus coming to receive his church, his body, his bride, as promised in John chapter 14. I go to prepare a place for you if it were not so. I tell you, but... Um, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. So he's not coming to uh, be here with us at the end of the age. He's coming to take us up to the Father's house. That's exactly what we see here in Revelation chapter 6 and then into 7. So the Revelation chapter 6, the sixth seal has just been opened. And the sky rolls up like a scroll, and everyone on the earth sees Jesus coming in the clouds with power and great glory. You may not be used to thinking of that as being the rapture, but it is. Once you put everything together, um, you realize, and that's what this whole segment in the book of Revelation is designed to do if you study it out and link it up, make all the appropriate connections with other passages of Scripture, particularly Jesus' Olivet Discourse, then it falls into place and you realize we've had a a scenario that really was not based on um, an accurate understanding of these things. One reason was because we came up with a seven-year tribulation 
um, rather than realizing the tribulation was a long event that spanned the entire church. So when you try to impose a seven-year future tribulation on end-time prophecy, you have nothing but chaos. It's really hard to see the scenario. You'll put things in the wrong place, events before others, and so forth. So that's what we're doing, is kind of clearing this up. Personally, from my point of view, uh, although the Lord told me, asked me to teach these things in a what I call my burning bush moment back in the early 1980s. I was going my own way, teaching everything I had been taught in Bible school and every, uh, where that I had grown up in church-wise and my Christian development. But then um, he, this confrontation and everything just went another direction because he said, I want you to teach people about my return. But when you do, I wanted to give them comfort, hope, and victory. Well, I had not been studying that subject, so for me, that was a hard right turn. But it was necessary to obey the Lord. I'm glad I did. And uh, in that call, he promised that he would teach me what I needed to know because I said, I don't know anything, but I want to teach it like you would teach it. If you're going to call me to do that, that's the, that's the parameters. That's what I'll agree to. It's like Moses when he said, you want me to go? I'm not going to go unless you go with me. So that was the deal. And uh, so thankfully, but from my perspective, if you're ready to go, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then really what does it matter? I mean, whether there's a secret rapture or whether there is... Um, he's coming at the end of this age and a different scenario from what you're thinking. Either way, once it happens, you're going. You see what I mean? If you're his when he comes, then you're going. So that was kind of my perspective. But then he began to teach me, no, it, it is important to know the scenario. Because for one reason, if you think and see, which many have, as I've taught them, and I've seen this from experience, when you teach them the chronos about the great week and thousand-year days, and you convince them through Scripture, which is easy to do because it's all over the Bible, when you convince them that he's coming at the end of the 6,000 years from Adam to rule and reign for the seventh day, then uh, and they see that, then their first question is, well, then do we back off seven years from that? And I'm like, no, he said he's coming then, not over here. He didn't say anything about backing off seven years. Seven years, backing it off because of a tribulation period, that's not even scriptural. It's not even biblical. So you can see why it's important to understand these things. Otherwise, you'll be thinking that he's coming. This is 2024. Um, you'll be thinking, for instance, that he's coming this year when there's no way that is coming here in 2024 um, because we're not at this end of the sixth day yet. We only have a handful of years left, but we're not quite there yet. So this is the advantage of these things. If he doesn't come this year, then what are you going to do? Are you going to be discouraged? Are you going to give up on his coming? Are you going to... Say, oh, well, I'm, that's it. I'm not studying this anymore because I have been let down too many times. Too many dates have come and gone. And I hear you. But you see, it's only because we neglected the truth of what I'm showing you here. We superimposed a seven-year tribulation on end-time prophecy when there shouldn't be one. And... Um, we refuse to see the Kronos aspect of his return because after all, the signs only tell you so much. When they regather the children of Israel from all around the world and they come back into their land and they regain control of Jerusalem, these are significant events. But still, how long is it from when Jerusalem is recaptured how long is it until he comes? You don't know. You can't tell from the signs by themselves. You can know you're getting closer and closer. But 
He wants us to know and see the signs and the fig tree signs and interpret them in the context of this great week so that we can say, I not only see the signs, but I can see the day approaching, that thousand-year day, that last day, because that's when he said he would resurrect us, raise us up, not when we see Jerusalem recaptured. You see, you have to keep things in their proper context. So here we are looking at this whole scenario, and we now know that from what we've seen, from what we've learned, this great multitude that suddenly appears in Revelation chapter 7 can only be, has to be, cannot be anything but his completed raptured church. Um, because that's when he said he would come at the end of this age. Jesus is not a liar. If he doesn't come at the end of this age, then what he said is not true. Of course he's not a liar. God cannot lie. He's not a man that he can lie. Well, what's the end of the age? What does that mean? Well, I just told you. It's all based on this great week of thousand-year days. And you have to know where you're at in the week so that you can see the day approaching. If it's, and take just a normal week, and let's say the last day of the week is Sunday, just for purposes of this example. If I'm at Friday, and I know it's Friday, then I know that tomorrow is not the day. I know that it's two more days. It's Sunday, not Friday. So that's what we have in Scripture. The same two things that a pregnant woman has. God's given us the same two things. The chronos time and the kairos signs. So a pregnant woman knows, well, I've got signs that indicate I'm pregnant and how far along I am. I have signs that are going to appear right at the end, too to know me, it's just about time, it's right time. But I also have, um, besides the signs, the kairos, I also have the chronos. And the chronos tells me that in nature, there's generally nine months between conception and birth. And so she also compares the signs with where she is in the terms of the number of months that have passed. The same th two things, these same two things have been given to us by the Holy Spirit in this book. That's why it's so powerful. So the end of the age, don't try to judge that by signs. Judge it by the Kronos times because each age is 2,000 years generally until you come to the end of the 6,000 years and then the age to come is 1,000 years. So you have two two, two, that's six, and then one. That's how this all is set up. God designed it. He predetermined it to be this way. And that is why, and that's the only way, you can see the day approaching, not just the signs. Now, with that said, here is chapter seven, and the great day of his wrath has just come, who's able to stand? And so John, um, in this vision, verse 9, I'll pick up there. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, out of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. And what are they doing? They're standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I mean, this is a standing ovation. This is the glorious praise and worship service. The angels are in attendance. All of the church is there, the completed church, his church, his body, his bride. In its fullness, the church has been built, his bride has been selected, chosen, and taken, so forth. So, here we are, and all the angels stood around too, and so this is a glorious, I mean, what do you think? We've just all been raptured. Jesus has come, he parted the heavens, and then he came and 
took us by sending forth his angels to gather us, gather his elect from the four corners, from heaven and earth, gathered us, I believe, in, in chariots of fire, and now we are back in heaven. We have just arrived. And can you imagine standing on the sea of glass before the throne with the whole church, everyone who has ever been saved since Jesus came the first time, this 2,000 years of the church age, we're all together. I can't, I've had a glimpse of it in my spiritual vision. And it's awesome. You, you're, the sense that you're there, it's over, you're safe, your salvation is secure, and you don't have to think about it or worry about it or um, fight any thoughts that you might not be worthy. Not all of that's gone. And you're standing there before God's throne, in his glorious throne, and with Jesus the Lamb. And everyone around you is like jumping up and down and dancing and worshiping with the top of their lungs. And the angels are in it too because everyone is so, well, you get the picture. Or if you meditate on that, you can. But here's the point. Then the angel in verse 13, or the elder, um, came up to John and said, John, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? This is important to the Holy Spirit, to God the Father, and to Jesus the Lamb, that we understand who these people are, this great multitude. That's the whole point of this book. So he wisely said, Sir, you know. And he said, Well, these are the ones who come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So these are the ones who came out of great tribulation. That's why we had to understand that term. We had to know that the great tribulation is not a future seven-year period or half of one connected with a future antichrist. There is a future antichrist, but it's not a seven-year period. And the, the tribulation does not have anything to do with him, although things are going to be bad on the earth. What's going on in his time on the earth is the wrath of God and the fact that the devil has come down to you with great wrath, knowing he has a short time. But this is not the tribulation that Jesus was talking about. How do you know? Because Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun, moon, and stars will be darkened. Well, I just showed you in Revelation chapter 6 that that sign just happened. That means the tribulation of those days is over. That means the great tribulation is over. And so then Jesus comes, it's the end of the age, but it's not the battle of Armageddon, the Antichrist is still on the earth. He still has three and one half years left. This is what you get when, but you have to study it out. But this is the true scenario. But where are we now? It's the end of the age, and where are we? See, it's the end of the sixth day, right? And it's the start of this seventh day, the age to come. So where are we? Well, we're standing in heaven before the throne. That's clear. And so John is told that this whole multitude, the church, his bride, came out of a period called Great Tribulation. We washed our robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now get this next part. This is the critical revelation. Therefore, they are, this great multitude, are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. Get this part. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. I mean, yeah, the sun's still going on. The sun's still there. It hasn't, it was just uh, blackened and darkened for this period, this sign. But the sun hasn't stopped shining. The sun is still in existence for those who are left behind on the earth. But for us, the sun will never strike you again because you're in the heavenly realm. You're in the third heaven with God. You're before the throne of God. That's your official position. That's your place and no heat will ever strike you. 
Now, the last verse in this is extremely important because the question is, if we're up in heaven at the throne of God, the whole church, as this sixth day ends and the seventh day, the thousand year day, the millennial reign of Christ begins, then where's Jesus? Well, I'll tell you where he ought to be because Paul made it very clear that when he comes in the rapture, that thus we shall always ever be with the Lord. So if we're here in heaven, then he certainly should be as well, right? Otherwise, Paul taught false doctrine. So the question is, where is Jesus as this last thousand-year day begins? The day in which he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years, where is he? Is he on the earth? Or is he in heaven at the throne of God with us? Or more better said, we with him. Well, verse 17 answers the question. Where is Jesus? For the lamb who is in the midst of the what? The throne. It doesn't say he's on the earth. It says the lamb who is in the midst of the throne where we are, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now for the rest of the book of Revelation, unless you're being shown a recap of the rapture, we're up in heaven. We're up in the third heaven where Jesus is. In other words, we will reign with him from up above. We don't need to live on the earth to reign over the earth but here's what I want you to get. The seventh day starts, get this, the seventh day starts with Jesus up in heaven in the throne and his raptured church just happened. Not seven years earlier, not three and a half years earlier. It happened at the sixth seal at the end of this age. So that the age to come this seventh day can be occupied with putting every enemy under our feet. Sit here while I put every enemy under your feet. Hallelujah. When are we going to start teaching it right? So that we're not confused. So that if they rebuild the temple... Someone who's been taught we're going to be gone before that doesn't go nuts thinking, did I miss? What happened? And so um, I'm just saying we can have a, a better idea of how that's going to happen. And it appears that God wants us to. He doesn't want us to just kind of not know. It's like a pregnant woman. It's better when she knows, isn't it? It's better when she knows her time has come. Hallelujah. Why shouldn't the church, why shouldn't his bride be any different? Hallelujah.